Um, thanks everyone for, for joining in. Uh, we felt like it would be a good idea to host a conversation and provide some guidance around um, all of the financial resources that are currently available for um, small business owners and event professionals. Um, so Jonathan Chow helped us um, with his contact. Uh, she knows all the things about all the things. <laughs> Yeah, so let's welcome uh, Mari Ramirez. Uh, she's an experienced CPA who's been in public accounting uh, for over 10 years in the greater Austin area uh, and surrounding areas. Her office is actually based in Georgetown, uh, but I've known her through um, just, we run in the same network. She does a lot of um, accounting work for very large uh, technology companies, as well as, um, you know, small businesses. And she herself is a small business owner. She started her own bookstore with uh, 10 other founders uh, in Georgetown. Is um, all women owned so she understands how small businesses are going through the situation right now as well as you know how the larger companies can also work within the system so um to save time uh, to get to the q a's i'm going to go ahead and give it a hand it over to Mari, and she can start with her presentation yeah i'm going to do hi hi everyone thanks for having me i really appreciate you all uh putting this together i've been this is all i've been talking about 24 7 so i feel like I feel like I know it, but I don't know it, you know, that's, that's all we've been talking about in counting groups, uh, text messages. It's just like been my life right now is this, these financial programs. Um, so it's been kind of crazy. So, but I do have to preface this with, it's very, very fluid. Um, things are changing on a daily, regular basis. Um, the SBA app, uh, some of the apps have changed from like one day to the next day. So it's been really crazy. Um, and so I definitely want you to, you know, this is going to be a very, um, this moment in time presentation and then keep asking questions, keep asking bankers, keep, you know, kind of keep informed um, and keep up to date. So I'm going to, I'm going to do a quick overview and we're going to get to the questions because the questions have really, really good meaty stuff. Y'all did really great with these questions. Um, so I, I felt like we'll do a quick overview for the people that are completely confused uh, about what's, what's happening. Um, and right now that the new programs they've put out with the, the, literally Trump signed into law on Friday, um, is the EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. I say Friday, last Friday. Um, and then the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, which that one's through the bank. Um, so I, I think I put it's not ready yet. Some banks, from what I hear, are ready. Um, bank of America has like a first sample one right now that's like a first step app if you're already a member with bank of america you should just like log in and try to do it right now but that being said you may not want to after i tell you all this but i i feel like it's it's worth it the eidl is already up on the sba website um and i'll, I'll show you that link in a second but it's very that one's a streamlined application and it's very easy to do and i can tell you the differences between the two um there's supposed to be a fourth part of this um package coming this week uh, or in the coming weeks. Um, and, and like I said, we are in a super fluid situation. Things are changing. Uh, regs came out last night. We were all reading them last night. So um, there's definitely a lot of things happening all at once right now. Um, let's just quickly discuss the EIDL because I feel like that is something you can do right now. Like as you're listening to this podcast, if you haven't already done this, click that link. It's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. It's a very easy um, application, name, address, gross revenues, cost of goods sold. Um, don't overthink it, you guys. Everyone's like, you know, what does this mean? What does that mean? I mean, like, it doesn't, you know, there's, you know, all the highlighted ones answer the questions. Um, this, is, this is a loan though. This one, you are applying for a loan. Doesn't mean just because you're filling out the application, you are like signing the dotted line and you have a loan now. Um, they're gonna come back and say, these are your loan terms. This is the amount that you've been qualified for. You can say yes, you can say no. Um, so, but this is a loan. So um, they're, they start, the payments don't start for one year later. Um, they, uh, the rate is 3.7.5%. There is a personal guarantee if they offer you $200,000. So there are some obviously things but the loan proceeds itself are not really specifically related to anything specific. Like you don't, you're not, you don't have to, you know, use it for payroll cost. It's really it could be for uh, operating expenses. It could be for anything. It is a loan. Now on the little application, I'm sure maybe some of you all have done it. There's a little check mark that says, ten, uh, I would like to apply for the $10,000 advance. Check mark that. Um, I don't, I don't know anyone that's gotten the $10,000. 
feel free to be like, yes, I got it. I'm going to be really happy if one person is like, I got the $10,000 because I have not heard anyone. No one's texted me. And I know a lot of people that have done this that have said, I got the $10,000. But the, the point is, if you get denied for this loan, supposedly you get to keep this $10,000. So um, it doesn't hurt to, you know, at least try for this. And if you get denied for this loan, you get this free $10,000 supposedly. Now the word around town is that, let's say they come back and they offer you a loan, that they're gonna forgive the $10,000 anyways, but I can't, we don't know that for sure. I, that might be in the fourth package. I don't know. That's what a couple of uh, political people have told me. Um, but anyways, um, they're not, so if you get denied, you don't have to, you don't have to pay the $10,000 back. Um, on here, I know I put minority and women are supposed to be priority, but there is nowhere on the application that it actually says that like, oh, hey, I'm a minority or woman. So I'm not really sure why that's one of the things on there. Um, that's one of the things we keep being told that women and my minority are priority for the SBA EIDL, but I just, there's just nowhere on there that it actually like, you know, says where we can state that. So I'm not sure about that. Now, this one, um, more information on this one. This one does not offer loan forgiveness. So this is the one that's just a straight up loan. You can't get both the EIDL and the PPP loans at the same time. You can apply for the EIDL now and then PPP, when it becomes available, some places are available, most places are not. If you qualify and accept the EIDL loan and then you qualify the PPP loan, you can refinance it or you can decide which one you want to do better. So, um, so there are options there. It's not like you're stuck with EIDL and you cannot do PPP. I've been telling people, if you are a self-employed worker, do unemployment, EIDL, PPPP in that order. Um, if you are a business owner, do EIDL and PPP, and then we can decide which one is better. I don't know which one's going to come back faster. I don't know which one's going to be ready yet. Um, but I think you should at least try for both, especially if you're closed or you had to furlough your employees or, um, you know, you, you can't take, you don't have that much um, work. You don't have any events, obviously, right now. So I think right now, this is for the event industry. Everyone should be at least trying to do both of these. Um, this is the, the PPP. This is the, this is the, the big one. This is the one I've been talking about like 24 seven. I mean, I've been talking about both of them, but this one's like the major one. This one, um, this one's based on payroll cost. There's supposed to be no personal guarantee, which I think is strange because some banks are asking for tax returns. And I'm like, like personal tax returns. I understand the business tax returns because you want to prove that you had maybe payroll costs or self-employed income, but that they're asking for personal tax returns. Some banks are, some banks aren't, um, but there's supposed to be no personal guarantee on this. Um, they're um, for the, in order to get the payroll costs, it's supposed to be salary, wages, commissions, or tips, and it's capped at $100,000. I know somebody had a question. Uh oh, there's a, miss, a missing zero there. Um, it's $100,000, not $10,000, $100,000. I know some people have been asking that I make over $100,000. It's really, then you just cap it at $100,000. It doesn't mean that you can't, you don't fall, you can't do this PPP. You just have to use a calculation at $100,000. So if you have like three employees and two of them are $100,000 or above, you just do $100,000 for the calculation. Um, employee benefits, including health insurance, um, a sole prop uh, or, okay, so for the payroll costs are supposed to be uh, for, also sole proprietors, independent contractors can be in this too. We'll talk about the, the payroll costs in a second. Um, wages, commission, income, net earnings from self-employment, and of course it's capped at $100,000 on an analyzed basis for each employee. So um, so again, I don't think, if you make over $100,000, it doesn't mean you can't apply for PPP. You just, you know, have to cap it. Um, some of the key dates today, April 3rd, right? Today's April 3rd, I'm lost with my dates is the first date, first date which small business owners and nonprofits can apply for this loan. So if you're a small business owner or a nonprofit, you're supposedly supposed to apply for this loan. Like I said, Chase is not ready. Um, some of the bigger banks aren't ready. Wells Fargo is not ready. Bank of America is, they have like a first step application. So if you're a Bank of America business account, you should just like log in and try to do it right now. But um, there's nothing concrete. Uh, I did get a message from someone saying that the Secretary of Treasury already said that they already have PPP loans going out. I don't know how that's possible um, because I don't, I mean, I, some banks are just not ready. Um, April 10th is the first day in which sole props and independent contractors and self-employed individuals are eligible to apply for PPP. The reason being is because they don't have 
the calculations completely ready for this specific part. Like we're just barely getting, you know, that first small business owners and nonprofits, what that involves in those payroll calcs and that pay the payroll cost number and what that what that number looks like. And we're still kind of arguing about that still, honestly, with the new regs that came out last night. So they definitely don't have that ready for sole props and independent contractors. I assume it's going to be from net earnings from self-employment. So like a 12 month PL, your net income from that, that's your payroll cost. I don't know that for sure. That's just kind of our thinking. The final date to apply for this loan is June 30th, 2020. Now that's assuming funds are not exhausted by prior to this date. If they're exhausted prior to this date, that's it. We got to, um, you know, that'll be the final date. I don't know when they'll exhaust. I think it's 350 mil billion. Someone can correct me. $350 billion allocated yeah. to this PPP. Billion. Yes, billion. yes, is that right? <laughs> yeah. um, so, so that being said, it, when we re they reach that number, that's it. No more can apply for this loan. So I would very much say absolutely get jump on the boat and already get your bank involved. If your bank is not, is one, you know, Wells Fargo, Chase, or one of those other banks that are not ready, just email your banker and say you, you're ready to do it and start working on those documents. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, who's eligible? Uh, this program's available to everybody, businesses, nonprofits, veteran organizations, tribal business concerns, so self-individual employed individuals, independent contractors with 500 or fewer employees. I put the sample app here but now a new one's kind of come out, but honestly, it's almost exactly the same. It's like, I think this, the new one, and I can, I can send the new one. I just saw it like a few minutes before this. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll go to that later. It's, the link's not working for me. Okay, how much is the loan? Now this is where it gets tricky. Um, the, the average monthly payroll from the prior year and I say prior year, I've heard different dates. Right now we're calculating it from February 15th, um, 2019 to February 15th, 2020. Um, and then we're adding back, you know, we're adding the health insurance, we're adding, um, you know, things like that. It's supposed to be all the payroll costs. Right now, from what I understand, independent contractors are included in this monthly payroll costs. Um, there's been some argument that independent contractors should not be added to that, but for this purpose, it should be added. Um, the new regs came out and they're still really unclear. That's been the discussion I was having with a bunch of other CPAs. So um, we're tr trying to get kind of verification on what that monthly payroll cost is. And that is how much the loan is. The average monthly payroll from the prior year two and a half times that. Um, and that is how they come up with the loan amount, right? I do have some really great um, payroll uh, calculation calculators to, to find this out. Um, also, if you're a member, if you're on Gusto payroll, they've come out with like a, a report that's super great for PPP. I know some of the other bigger ones, ADP and stuff like that have been trying to get that together as well. Um, but right now Gusto already has a link already there with like PPP report, click on it, that's it. They've already got it ready for you, um, which has been super helpful in this calculation. Um, so, but like I said, Payroll cost is kind of up in the air. Um, and as I, as I was saying, if you do Gusto and you don't have independent contractors on Gusto, um, you have to add in your independent contractors, assuming independent contractors are allowed in this calculation. Um, but right now, I'm, from what I'm reading, it sounds like they are. Um, how can we get the loan forgiven? Um, so this is another weird question that's been a little bit weird. Um, so when amounts paid in the eight weeks starting on the date of orig origination date, you can use it for all these things, right? That says their payroll, interest on mortgage, rent, utilities, tip wages, commissions, health insurance. You cannot use more than 25% for non-payroll cost. So basically if you use more than 25% of the loan cost or non-payroll cost, then a percentage of it won't be forgiven. If you get, um, see, it, and so it says here it's reduced if you're, it, so basically you have to hire everyone back on by June 30th. This is the part that we don't know for self-employed people, what that means for them. Um, does that mean they just keep themselves on? Uh, we don't know. So that's the part that's a little bit weird for self-employed people, but for, you know, employers that have hired 
um, people, one of the questions I keep having is, um, what if my employees don't want to come back? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's on the number of employees, full-time equivalent. So you just have to hire someone else back. The point is to hire everyone back to their jobs. It doesn't mean the same person. It means people in general, right? So um, you, what you want to do is just make sure everyone's hired back on by June 30th. Um, and it kind of gives you a, a little bit, if you do, if you don't, and you, and there's a reduction, like it says there, there's a reduction in the, in the number of employees, then it's reduced the loan forgiveness. So it's not like it's all or nothing. It's just reduced by a certain amount. Um, if you're not eligible, what are the payoff terms? So even if it's like a portion of loan forgiveness and you don't qualify for forgiveness or part of it's not forgiven, the funds basically have to be paid in 10 years and it's supposed to be no more than 4%. Um, the payments start six months after loan origination and the loan term is 10 years. So it's not, you know, a terrible loan or anything. Um, and again, it could be a partial forgiveness. Um, some other notes that I have here, and this is the end of it and we'll get to the question because I know the questions are really meaty. Um, and hopefully I didn't go too fast, but I know a lot of people know a lot about this and been reading up on this. Um, for self-employed, like I said, we don't have a lot of guidance on how to calculate that loan forgiveness. Um, so I think that'll come down the funnel. They'll have to figure it out before April 10th because April 10th is when we can start um, doing those applications. Um, we do know that not more than 25% should be used for non-payroll cost, um, but I'm not sure what that means for them. Um, and I think if you need if you need funds ASAP, you definitely need to apply, apply for EIDL, like I said earlier, and unemployment in your state. And the reason being, a lot of the contractors or freelancers are eligible to receive half of their state's average weekly unemployment plus an extra $600 a week for up to four months and extends existing state benefits by 13 weeks. So with that new with the new plan that was signed last Friday, they did increase the unemployment benefits six hundred dollars a week for up to four months. So, and then of course, like if you have reduced work, you just are not getting enough projects, but you have some projects, you can you might be able to still apply for partial unemployment. Um, but I also think it's very important that, um, I, and this has to do with the the PPP that you would be off unemployment by June thirtieth, and I think that is the complete ideal version of what they want PPP to be for self-employed people, right? So that everyone's off unemployment by June 30th. And I think that might be one of the caveats. Um, oh, um, and so, and that's, that's my kind of summary of, of all there is for um, the programs. Um, I do want to get into the questions. Jonathan, do you actually have the questions on hand? Cause I don't even have the questions on hand. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, let me go ahead and pull them up. So um, these questions were the ones that were submitted. Uh, when you guys registered for Eventbrite, there was a field that had a question about like, what do you have, what do you want to know? Um, so let me go ahead and uh, start us off with the first couple of them. Um, give me a second here. So uh, the, first, the first one is, is there, can you go ahead and read the first one out there? Computer seems to be really slow now. And loading this page. I think I got it. Is the is the ten thousand yeah, dollar advance a grant? Go. Is that the first one? Yeah. Yeah, that's the first one. Yeah. Okay. Is the ten thousand dollar advance a grant? Um, a grant contingent on use to cover payroll expenses, an advance of a loan, or a partially forg fully forgivable if other conditions are met. Okay. So let's say this the ten thousand dollar advance. This is the EIDL. This is the SBA EIDL, and that one's funded by SBA. And I want if you go to sba.gov, click on economic uh, injury disaster, you can right now apply for it. And it gives you a little check mark. I want the 10K advance, okay? If you get denied for this, this is what I was saying, it's supposed to be forgiven and you're supposed to be able to keep it, keep it, not return it back. If you do get offered a loan, um, if you do get offered a loan and you don't accept it, you do have to pay it back, supposedly. That might be changed. Um, if you do get the PPP, then you refinance the EIDL with the PPP, right? So you just use those funds to pay, you know, and refinance it. So uh, it's kind of yes to all of the instances. It could be an advance on a loan. It could be forgivable. It's not definitely not partially full forgivable. And it may be if you get, uh, you know, accept it for the loan, it may be forgiven in a future um, package. I'm just not, we're not exactly sure yet. Again, I don't know anyone that's gotten the $10,000 advance. Feel free to say, yes, I did get it. I'm so curious, but none of my clients have gotten it from what I understand. So 
it's supposed to be funded in three days. I know people who did it on Monday, they don't have it in their banks today. So um, I'm sure they're overloaded. Um, the other question is, if we PPP, if we are granted this loan and want to use it to pay furloughed employees, can we place stipulation on what employees must do to receive back pay? i.e. work a certain number of shifts when companies back to full operations, et cetera. From my understanding, if there is, well, and this is a discussion we were having with a bunch of other people too, is that everyone has to get basically their job back by June 30th, right? If, the, if you're not open yet, you still have to be paying them in order to be forgiven. That's, that's part of the downfall of this. Um, you basically have to start paying everyone and make sure that they are on payroll, even if you're not open. So whatever that may mean. Um, there's not really much guidance on that, except everyone has to come back on. I'm not sure, it's not necessarily that, um, that you have to play stipulations or anything, that it just has to be the number of full-time equivalents that you had before is the number of full-time equivalent that you have on June 30th. So um, you just have to have everyone back on by that point. And maybe we'll be in a better position that people can, you know, have work to do, um, but we're not sure about that. Um, but they don't necessarily have to receive back pay. So that's a misnomer. You don't have to receive back pay. You just have to have everyone on payroll by June 30th. Um, and, and they don't have to work a certain number of shifts necessarily. Um, but you could, if you, let's say you're not open, you could say, you start paying them and say, um, you know, I need you to do this work coming up. And especially the salary people might be easier. It might be harder for the hourly people. Um, so, but, but the point is that everyone's back to, back to work, quote unquote. Again, I think some of that's going to change with the, some more legislation, but r right now that's how it is. And I think, I think my belief, this is my opinion, they probably extend, extend that June 30th date because if if the you know the world is still sheltering in place to some degree, I don't I don't think it's going to be possible for places to be open and have employees completely working. So, I I think they might change that date. Um, so I know I answered the question, but I still I still don't 100 percent know. <laughs> Everything's very fluid. Um, how are we able to secure a loan quickly? It seems to be most sites are overloaded. They are super overloaded. Um, I, you know, I know some of my clients have literally emailed bankrupts, like, here's the app, all filled out, here's a documentation, tell me what to do next, because um, that's all they can do, and I think banks are just completely overloaded, and I think, I think right now, the best thing to do is just get all your ducks in order and get all that paperwork together, get those numbers already filled out. Um, there's supposed to be an online app that's going to come up today, I, I haven't seen it come up except for the few you know, banks that have some community banks, I, I think maybe have an, like a first step app. Um, it doesn't hurt to just whatever, whoever the bank that you're right, you know, with, if you're with Chase and Chase is completely not up right now, unless it just happened in the next, you know, the last 20 minutes. Um, I think just emailing the banker and saying, hey, I want to do this. Here's what I have so far. What else do you need for me? And they'll give you a list of things that they need. So just kind of being ahead of it and just keep checking every day. You know, um, maybe you don't have to check every hour, but just check every day. Send a message to your banker. I think they're just completely overloaded at this point. Um, so anything you can do, just kind of get your name out there just to make sure that, you, you know, they don't forget you. Um, can did I see a question? Yes, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, real quick. Do you want to um, talk about the uh, kind of the things we were talking, we were like chatting on online about the relationship with the banks and how each bank's going to be processing things differently? Can you speak yes. a little bit more to that? So, so from my understanding, you have to already have a relationship with the bank um, prior to. I, some of them are like February fifteenth. You have to be a business, you know, member of their bank by February 15, 2020. If you're not, you may not be able to apply for that. Um, and I know some banks from my, like there was a lot of skepticism and I think some banks are like literally pulling out. Now, I don't know that for sure. There's just a lot of talk around town that like um, there's just not enough guidance and banks aren't ready for this. And honestly, I don't know when they'll be ready. They were saying, I mean, all week long they've been saying Friday and here it is Friday and they're not ready yet. So I just, they might be pushing it off. Um, and it makes people uneasy when they see these tweets from the secretary treasurer saying, oh, we've already gotten this much money out of PPP and people are like freaking out. They don't want money to be gone. Um, 
I, I don't know any private lenders that are actually doing this without you already having a bank account because they're completely overloaded. Um, is that what were you talking about, Jonathan, or is there something else? Yeah, exactly. And then also um, to piggyback on that, we actually have a ch question in the chat that's mm -hmm. related on the topic, so I figured we'd just go to it now. Yes. Um, Grace, uh, Grace Post, she said, um, looks like this delayed now. She recites a Forbes article about a okay. false start on the PP, uh, PL, P the PPP program. There could be. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't checked recently. From my understanding, I know everyone's been delaying it. There's, like I said, Bank of America is already up with their first step. So um, they're probably doing nothing with it. Like at the, you know, I asked where the person that I know that did Bank of America this morning. I said, what did it tell you at the end? He's like, it just says thank you for submitting. We'll get back to you. And it really was like a basic you know, thing. So I don't think anyone's really ready for it. And like I said, the regulations that came out last night, yesterday are very vague still. They're still not like in the, a whole lot of guidance um, on a lot of things. And I think the banks are trying to scramble. Um, so it may be possible that they're pushing off some of this. Um, oh, and I'm just getting a message about the BOA. I guess the, the Bank of America uh, is definitely kind of pushing it off. They're getting slammed. Um, yeah, that's crazy. So I think they're, they might be the only ones that are actually letting people kind of like sort of apply or they feel like they're applying. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, it may be pushed off. I think the key dates probably will change right now. That's what the key dates are. Um, but I think it doesn't hurt to keep asking the bankers, you know, hey, what's going on with this? Um, hopefully the banks don't jump out because that was the other conversation we were having. Some banks are going to jump out of this and they may, and that would leave everyone, if people are already have a, a relationship with, you know, Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo's like, forget it, we're not doing this. Then what are they going to do? I'm not sure. So there's got to be some private lenders that maybe are hopefully taking some of the slack up. Did you have another question, Jonathan, that, that you saw? No, let's just go ahead and go um, down to the other questions on the from the previous the people that registered on the document I sent over. And then we have a note from uh, Yara saying uh, RBFCU is doing it now. Um, oh, so awesome. Good to know. Good to know. I have some RBFCU people, so that's good. I think they weren't up earlier, but maybe they're up now. That's great. Um, yeah, if, if you all know any other banks that are doing it, feel free to comment. Um, I'm pretty sure it's probably just first steps, you know, with name and stuff, uh, but whatever we can do. Um, and honestly, I think getting these calculations are not that hard because trying to calculate it, don't overthink it, get the payroll cost, um, get your health insurance numbers divided by 12, use that as a number. They're going to want proof of 941s and W3s anyways, I would imagine, of attaching that later. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but try to get it as much as possible and if you have a payroll company have them do it for you if you can have them say hey i need a report for ppp they may be able to pull it for you just like gusto so anything that you can do i just don't want people to overthink it and not get those stuff those things those items together and not you know miss that opportunity to apply for ppp um the, go ahead sorry there are two questions that came in that are related so i just wanted to go ahead and ask them the first yes. is what defines a full-time employee or the SBA EIDL and or the PPP. The second question is, I was confused reading the rules. Can we use money for time or hourly employee or only full-time people? No, so when I say full-time equivalent, it's really, it could be a 20 hour person plus another 20 hour person. It could be part-timers. So full-time equivalent means um, it could be three part-timers that each work, you know, uh, 15, 20 hours a week or whatever. It, it, it's really full-time equivalent. It doesn't mean that it's only full-time people. It's just equivalent. So two part-timers that make one full-time person, that is a full-time equivalent. So you would have to, if you have two part-timers, right? And you have to hire two part-timers back, you can hire one full-time person at, on, by June 30th. So it's just the equivalent. It doesn't mean the exact number of pe people. What was the other question? Oh, I just one second. Sorry, I can't remember now. Um, Similar, I think. Like, oh, what defines a full time employee for the SBA EIDL and or for the PPP? Yeah, so that, that's exactly so it's, it's not necessarily just full time people. It could be part timers, it could be someone that worked 10 hours a week, right? Someone that worked 10 hours a week, it's just that you have to have the equivalent of that added up as far as hours. So if they're salary people, that's easy because they're full timers. Salary people are fine. 
but the full-time equivalent people would be all the part-timers. So if you have 10 part-timers that make up, make four full-time equivalents, then as long as you hire four full-time equivalent, it could be 10, it could be 20 part-timers. The point is, is that you have four full-time equivalent. Does that make sense? I hope, hopefully that makes sense. Was there another one? Uh, no, I, I guess the next question would be, um, uh, I guess we talked about this securing the loans, um, the sites are overloaded. So the next would be PPP loans versus disaster loans, which part is forgivable? I know you covered a bit on the, in the presentation, but that was a question. That right, right, right. Um, yeah, so the, the PPP loans are the one that can be forgivable. The disaster loan, the EIDL, that it is not forgivable, but you can refinance it with the PPP loan, or you could just not accept it if they come and offer you. Hopefully by that point, the PPPs come out, they offer you that. Um, you might be in a place where they offer you EIDL and you haven't gotten the numbers for PPP, you might have to say no, or maybe there's a time limit, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, the PP, from what I know, the PPP loan is the only one that's forgivable. Um, do you need to apply for SBA loan in order to be eligible for future populists? No, I don't think you do, but it, I think it doesn't hurt to do that one. Uh, I'm sorry, do you need to apply for SBA loan in order to be eligible for future possible stimulus for SB for small business owners? I, I don't think you do, um, but I think it doesn't hurt to just put your name in the system. Now, I know people that did the SBA loan, the EIDL, uh, probably a week or two before, and there was two different applications before the streamline application. They made them redo it again. So it's actually like, so after the law passed, even though they submitted two different applications already, they still had to redo the streamline application. So although it doesn't hurt to do it, you might have to redo it again, if that makes sense. Um, about the SBA loan, I'm an LLC and I'm the only one on payroll of sorts. I'm not sure if I qualify for it because of the language. Notably eligible payroll costs do not include compensation for employees who receive more than $100,000 annually in wages. I personally made over $100,000 last year but my AGI was less than 100. I also just paid myself 6K a month, so my yearly payroll would be under 100K. So would I qualify or no? Now, this is also um, going to be the last 12 months divided by 12. If that's less than $100,000, then you could just use that number. If it's more than $100,000, they're just gonna cap it at $100,000 and use that as the basis for your payroll cost, quote unquote. So doesn't mean that you don't qualify. It just means you're capped at $100,000. That makes sense. Um, so, um, and also depending on if you're on the only one on payroll of sorts, if you're literally on payroll, they'll use that number. If it's your self-employment, then that's a whole other ball game. So it really just depends on how you're doing it. If you're like an S corp and you run yourself a payroll, that's different than if you're a sole prop and you have your net income and take distributions. To there might be totally different calculations between the two. So it doesn't really say that in the question, but um, I feel like I have to uh, explain that. Um, as a solo business owner, no employees, how do I fund or fall under the loss of a job? This is exactly what I was talking about before. We don't really have guidance on that sole business proprietor on what that number looks like. I think probably getting your P&L in order for the last 12 months is the best thing you can do to prepare for that April 10th debt, you know, um, application date, which who knows if they're going to be ready for self-employed people. But I think my belief is they're going to use that net earnings from self-employment. That's what they say in the rule and the, in the bill is they're going to use net earnings from self-employment as a basis for the payroll cost for a self-employed individual. So they'll be using that. If you can get your books in order, if you have time, go through your accounting or get a bookkeeper, get an accountant. I'm happy to help if you need help. Um, someone to help you get your books in order for the last 12 months to get those numbers in order, which is probably the best idea at this point um, for, to get those ready for it. And you will fall under the loss of a job because that would, that would kind of say, okay, you know what, the 2020 doesn't look that great. And this is what 2020 looks like. And, and then you'll kind of figure out what your loan will be under PPP. Um, the grant on 410 will online regs be different. I think the online re regulations will be different for the April 10th application. Yes, because they're going to do the calculation differently for self-employed individuals than they will for like payroll costs for people who have payroll. I think those two things will be different. Um, what if you already submit it before knowing about the wait date? I'm not sure what you submit it. I, I'm assuming maybe the EIDL 
is what that person submitted. Um, but that's cool. I think that's great. If someone submitted it without knowing about the dates and they submitted it, I'm not sure how they submitted it, but that's amazing. I say <laughs> just keep asking the banker if you did it through a bank. If you did the EIDL, then that's fine. That's great. If that if they meant the EIDL, then I think um, I think that's great. Um, did I did I miss a question? Uh, one of the other questions was deadlines for applying. I think we uh, basically the deadline is June thirtieth, or they run out of funds. So we have some time, but if they run out of funds like May 1st, then that's a deadline. We don't know. Um, oh, great. Thank you, Jonathan. You just pointed out to me. Uh, the next question. I have two separate revenue streams, music instruction, school live performances, touring. Gigs are canceled. We are able to Skype some students, but drop in lessons revenue has been substantial. How to proceed in the right directions for assistance for business and impersonal revenue loss. Now, questions on that. If this is an LLC, still do the EIDL. I mean, do the EIDL if personal or LLC. Do the EIDL either way. Do the unemployment either way. Then when you do the PPP, you can still do it. If you have an LLC, you might be able to even do it tomorrow or today. I keep saying tomorrow because I did some webcast yesterday. Um, you might still be able to do it today that's a question for their banker but if you're self-employment with all these those would be all included under the april 10th deadline so i would put those even if they're two different revenue streams they're still included in your self-employed income so um regardless if they're two different revenue streams or three different revenue streams if they're all under your name you want to include that as your net earnings from self-employment in order to qualify and um, have that ppp loan so you definitely can you just might have to wait on the time for this because um, it might, it's not gonna be out till April 10th. That being said, right now what you could do is the EIDL, which is on the SBA.gov link, go to SBA.gov, click on economic injury disaster loan, click on that and do, do the streamline application, use your gross revenues, put all the revenues that you make in the separate shares all together and use that as a, you know, as a numbers um, and also do your state unemployment. Um, like right now. That's the one thing you could do right now. Um, so real quick, Mari, on yes, the question ahead. before that, um, when you're talking about the grant, the question about the grant on 410 with online reg be different, I just highlighted that question. Uh -huh. um, when you answered, you weren't sure what they applied for. I just checked with the uh, person that submitted the question. Uh -huh. They said it was the EIDL that they applied for. So um, what happened if they submitted before the- Got it. The that is a different, the EIDL up is up right now. Everyone should be doing that right now. The 410 deadline is for the PPP for self-employed people. Two different things. Okay, great, thank okay. you. Okay, so he's fine or she's fine. If he submitted, if they submitted the EIDL, perfect, they did perfect. I wanna know if they got the 10K advance. That's what I wanna know, but I doubt it. <laughs> no one's gotten it yet. Um, but if they, if they already did it, that's great. That's perfect. The next step is the April 10th date. Totally separate application. So they're gonna have to do totally separate application for the April 10th uh, PPP. So two different applications. Um, and then, so the next question is, um, they would like to know about the PPP program for small businesses. I, I believe we covered uh -huh. that in depth. Um, and then whoever asked the questions, if you have anything specific, please uh, feel free to put it in the Q and A. We'll ask a little bit more. Um, so moving on to the next pre-submitted question. We have uh, unemployment versus PPP. Can you talk a little bit more yes, about that? Yes, that was what I was talking about, the unemployment. Definitely file for unemployment. The whole idea for the PPP is that everyone's off unemployment by June 30th. So I would go to un get unemployment right now, apply for unemployment. If you have a loss in wages right now, you should be applying for the unemployment, especially because contractors and freelancers are eligible to receive half of it and plus an extra $600 a week for four months. So apply for it. The thing is with the PPP, once you apply for the PPP and you get it and you receive it, you should be off unemployment by June 30th, right? That would be the, that's literally the whole point of PPP is everyone's back to work. Nobody's on unemployment. So, um, so that's the caveat. You have to remember that if you're going to do the PPP, everyone's basically back to work, including yourself as a self-employed contractor. Mari, someone just wrote in with a question in regards to filing for unemployment. Um, would you recommend still doing that even if they are still employed, but just a pay 
Oh, sorry, say that you cut out. They got a pay reduction? Yes, would you recommend that people file unemployment if they're still employed but got a gotcha. pay reduction? Gotcha. Yes, I think you should, if you got a pay reduction, I think you should definitely still apply for uh, unemployment. But based on this, depending on which state it is, they, they offer different uh, things for partial unemployment, but they could they could still apply for partial unemployment. I'd still so think- state of, The right. state of Texas? For the state of Texas definitely example? offers partial unemployment. So- Okay, and then, I'm oh, sorry, leading up to that? that? Yeah, that's good. And then we have a, another question related to that. Mm -hmm. um, they ask, as a sole prop LLC, Am I eligible for unemployment or partial unemployment? Uh, depends and the loss of wages. So if you're an LLC and you lost all your jobs, that would be a full unemployment, believe it or not, on your own LLC. If you didn't lose all your jobs and you still have some coming in, then it might be a partial unemployment. It just depends. And they're going to ask you those specific questions on the application. Um, it, it could be, I mean, as a sole prop, anybody, if you have a sole proprietorship, and you have lost like a really big job, you can go file unemployment on yourself and it's totally fine. It doesn't hit you. I mean, the contractors are allowed to file unemployment um, and say, I've lost my jobs as a self-employed person. So you can definitely go file it. Um, and I think they've been, I mean, they've been overloaded from my understanding. People are waiting online. I think there's an online application uh, to do it that might make things easier. They're just taking forever to process a lot of them because they're completely overloaded. So to follow up, um, th that person that asked the same question is, uh, how do they, or what do they require to prove loss of jobs? And they're a planner if that, so they plan events, so how would they prove that? Or Right, I don't think they're doing a whole lot. I mean, honestly, even before all of this, that people, like when I've had, I've helped other people do unemployment applications and there's not a lot of red tape there. Um, they're just like, I have, I need to file unemployment. Um, and this is what I was making before and I've lost that job. And there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of proof that you can have. Obviously right now, I think might be a little bit easier just because of the crisis that we're in. Um, I think before they were just like asking for like bank statements of, or of some sort, but I don't even know if they're doing that at this moment. Uh, when, when there's a time of crisis, unemployment kind of like relaxes a lot of those requirements. Um, they may call like your certain, um, certain other contractors that you had, like if you had 1099s, they may call them and say, hey, is this person still working for you? And they may say, no, they're not. Some things like that, but they may not even be doing that right now, honestly. Because like I said, they kind of relax a lot of their rules when there's an economic crisis. That makes sense. Uh, was there another follow-up one? Um, so something that's similar in the same vein is um, in terms of unemployment, uh, we have a question that says, if you're one person self-employed independent contractor, what paperwork would you need? Um, if, if you're just like a, a self-employed contractor, what? Yeah, so they, they, um, they ask if you're a one person self-employed independent gotcha. contractor, what paperwork do they need? You know, the last time I did one, and this was not during this kind of crisis, um, and I helped someone do one, we said this is how much they made before, and this is they're not making any of that now, and we didn't have to submit anything. So I, I can't imagine, I, I mean, I say that, I think we may have submitted like a, a PNL from before of how much they made, but I don't even really think they might be requiring that. Um, I, I think it doesn't hurt to just go onto the, and see what numbers they may need from you and how much you were making before. They may ask for a PNL for last year, but they may not even do that. Um, I think that a lot of the contractors, freelancers are just getting that and they have like a, a certain number that they're going up to. Like if you made a certain amount, you may receive half of that based on the average weekly benefits of some sort. So I think they're just kind of following those kind of regs uh, as, the, as the federal government's been producing them. Um, and then plus the $600 a week. So I don't think they're being really picky about it, um, especially in certain um, industries. I think the event industry would be a perfect one because they're going to ask you, what did you do before? And that's what you're going to play. Obviously, there's no events happening right now. So I don't think they're going to be very particular in this type of industry. And a lot of some of the, I mean, a lot of the, you know, 
other industries as well um, because they're going to look at that. Um, I'm not an unemployment lawyer <laughs> or by any means. So, uh, you know, feel free to call your, your state unemployment person. They're all really nice, except they're just overloaded. They're super overloaded. Um, but look at the Te Texas Workforce Commission. If you just put Texas Workforce Commission, if you're in Texas, unemployment benefits, um, and literally the link is super easy if you do it online. So I say just go jump in it do it online, you know, follow the questions. There's not a lot of documentation that needs to be answered. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to try. Uh, and I think you do that now because you, there might be a big of a wait to get that, to receive those benefits. Um, but like I said, if you do the PPP, you're going to have to basically be off unemployment by the time it's June 30th, if that makes sense. Um, and then, um, a related question that someone mm -hmm. sent in. Yes, um, tell me. It's about, I, I believe this is related to unemployment. Uh, they ask if, uh, do you have to have a Texas driver's license to apply? They recently moved here and did not get to the DMV prior to the COVID uh, keeping us home. So do they need to apply in the state they moved from? I do not know that, but I would still, because they live in Texas now, I would apply in Texas um, still. Um, and they may have to apply in both places if they worked in the other state. Like you might have to do both, but I would still apply in the state that you live in right now, um, especially if you, had planned to like work here and or started to a little bit of work here i would still your last place of employment was in texas as in as in contract work in texas definitely apply in texas for sure i don't think you need to have a texas driver's license though to be um to be an unemployed person under an, under those benefits in texas because so there's a lot of people there's too many people uh not even a paycheck you just have to have started working in the state of texas um, so if you had like even one gig right before all of this happened and you had just moved to Texas, you still had work here in Texas. As long as you did some, something in Texas right before this event, um, I think you're, you're still qualified to file unemployment in the state. Now, let's say you just moved here and your last place of work was that other state, probably should apply for that other state, except, um, uh, you know, it just depends on the circumstances, really. That, that's a very specific question. But again, I would go to the state unemployment, Texas unemployment, Texas Workforce Commission, unemployment benefits, and start filling those apps out, you know, and get as far down as you can. And, um, and, and then they'll call you for more questions if they need more information. Have any awesome. questions of people who are saying they've tried to apply um, some people for weeks at a time and they can't seem to get through or the website crashing? Yes. Yeah. I, the website does keep crashing. I think, I think they've just been overloaded. Somebody was telling me they have to do it, that they had some luck doing it really early in the morning. Really, yeah. So that's, yeah, the, so that's what I've been hearing. They've had luck getting through really early in the morning. Yeah. Really early or really late. We actually have someone that said they got through at midnight. Um, from, from what I've heard from people, just talking to people about it, uh, basically, if you apply like on non-peak hours, like not during the workday, just apply really late at night, middle of the night or early in the morning, you'll get through on the website. Otherwise, you could try calling their phone numbers. Uh, I could give you a resource on like all the list of phone numbers you could try calling um, and that might get you through. But um, definitely the online thing is the way to go because the phone numbers yes. you're just going to be on hold forever, if not just busy signal. Yes, I, I feel like if you can get online and submit it online, that is the best way to get in line for those unemployment benefits for sure because on the phone it'll take a little bit longer I feel like but you're right the website does keep crashing um definitely do it super early in the morning I did not know about midnight I just keep hearing about early in the morning is the best way because nobody's on it early in the morning I I keep thinking all the night owls are like up at night doing it so like me I don't know um but uh you know may, apparently maybe like put your alarm on for 2 a.m. and just try it. I mean, it doesn't hurt, 3 a.m., right? Just super, super random, 2 or 3 a.m., maybe, maybe. Um, I think they're they're trying to hire more people from what I heard just to get the, just to get those lines going. Because this is, this is the thing, this law passed on Friday, like signed into, you know, by Trump on Friday last week. So I think the lines have been overloaded this week because of this extra $600 a week. So I don't think it's going to continue to be busy. You know what I mean? So I think this is like a very, this window of this week has been crazy for TWC because of this new law. I think it'll slow down maybe a little bit, maybe this weekend, maybe next week, people 
you know, I don't know. That's just my belief. Um, it's always like that when something new happens, it's like everybody jumps on it. I think this is the same thing with PPP, you know? Um, Anyways, well, where do we leave off on the questions? So um, related questions about the unemployment. Um, yes. Somewhat, uh, Dale asks, he has two businesses, uh, both which are at a dead stop. Uh, can he file for unemployment on both or yes. just one? Uh, well, it depends on how they're structured, but he may be able to file unemployment on both for sure. Uh, like if okay. one is an LLC one's, or they're both self-employed, he can say this is what he's, he was making before for both, you know, businesses and this is what he you know he wants to apply for uh, unemployment and he and he could still file on both would they would the i guess the way he deposit money has to be in two separate bank accounts then or if he commingled no the, no the he stream? can come in yeah the he it could be his personal bank account because it's really just depending on the self-employment income he's the one filing for unemployment so so either way like you can file on both, say this is where this is the work he did on both of those parties, and that'll take into consideration for his for his total amount, if that makes sense. Okay. And then uh, Megan asks, so if you work in multiple states, can you apply for unemployment in those different states? Um, I want to say yes, because uh, you might be paying state taxes already for the other state. So a lot of the companies that you work for, they may be withholding for unemployment anyways in that state. Now it depends on how she's like, if someone's working as a W-2 employee for a different state, they may already be paying taxes for it. So they may qualify for unemployment in those states. But if they're doing contract work and there's not anything being withheld and they're not doing state tax returns, they may not be allowed to. But I say just try it, like try it at all. Uh, I don't, I don't think it hurts, especially if there's a significant amount of your work in a different state. I say if, if it's a significant amount of work, you should definitely try to apply in that state. They may say no, um, but they may say yes, depending on what you're doing in that state. It just really just depends, honestly, and depends on if y'all are paying, if you're paying taxes or your employer's paying, t paying taxes on that state. Um, that makes a huge difference between those, those two things. Okay. So just to stay on unemployment for a little bit longer before mm -hmm. we go back to those um, mm -hmm. uh, small, biz small business loans questions, um, we have someone asking if you're fully employed at the moment, um, but they're nervous about being laid off in the coming months, would you recommend them filing for unemployment to quote unquote get online? Um, they're not sure if they'll be unemployed or not in the future. I don't think you can't, I don't think they'll allow you to. If you're already employed, you can't file for unemployment. So you're just basically backing everybody up for people that are actually not working. So I would say no, and maybe somebody else would give different advice, but I would say no, those people that are already employed, you kind of have to wait until you know you're going to be laid off. Now, there are some people that are, know they're gonna be laid off by a certain date, like, or their severance pay ends on a certain date, you can file for unemployment. Like some people are getting severance pay until you know April 30th, but they're getting paid till April 30th. They can already file uh, for unemployment and say my last paycheck date will be April 30th. Those people can do it. But if you're already employed and you don't know if you may or may not have a job, you kind of have to wait until then. I've been trying to tell people um, a lot of my businesses, like if you know you can't, you're going to have to fire or furlough people by certain dates, you kind of need to, if, that would be great if you could let them know. It's always hard to do that. But if you know, you can kind of give people a heads up, like we might not have work until this time, that they can at least start working for someone else or start filing unemployment. But if you already employed and you don't know if you're going to, you know, get fired or get laid off or furloughed, I definitely would recommend to file unemployment because they may deny you and then you have to reapply again. That's not, that's not fun. Okay. And then one last thing about unemployment. Um, if there, uh, the question is, as a sole prop LLC, do I need to stop paying myself a salary each month in order to qualify for unemployment? Uh, same person that said they have no business going on right now. So I guess they're just paying themselves from their oh, savings. No. So basically you're just paying yourself out of retained earnings. No, continue to, if you have like a savings, you can still pay yourself from your business savings or your retained earnings. That isn't, but if you're not having additional money come in, you definitely need to file unemployment. It's two different things, right? That's, it's not like, just because you have money saved in the account, you can't file unemployment. There's not money coming in either to be replenishing it. So definitely file for unemployment uh, if you don't have any more business coming in or businesses shortened, if that makes sense. Okay, wonderful. There's Perfect. another. Is there another question coming in? I see a couple more. I can't um, see yeah. them, but. So that's, um, that's going to, I guess we have some, let's go back to the small business owners. Um, okay. I guess we covered most of the unemployment stuff. Um, well, actually, one quick quick thing before we go there. We have a question about, uh, are there any financial programs to help freelance musicians at this time? 
um, so I guess they're musicians, they're freelance, but I don't know how they're being, how they're paying themselves or what they're costing. Uh, those people need to be applying for the EIDL and unemployment and PPP. I don't know specifically. I know, I think that's probably the reason why is one of the, one of the things that we got a heads up for this PPP loan uh, program is that they were saying that the musicians um, are going to be one of the ones that are um, kind of recognized as like the industries that are hurting. Um, I'm not seeing any regulations that are showing. I know some of the NICS codes that start with 7-2, like the, the restaurants and the retail are supposed to be um, more, most important in the PPP, um, but I haven't, that's what it says in the regs, but it isn't, I'm not hearing that from a bunch of people. I'm not sure if musicians are 7-2. I don't okay. think so. Um, but, but nonetheless, I think that it's still, um, some of those some of those different industries that are hurt really badly i think those are going to be priority but they're still going to be the same as the applications as everyone else and all other small businesses i just think that certain industries are going to be more priority because they don't have anything going on um and they're definitely hurting at this point um sorry i don't have a real concrete answer for that specifically um but i but i just definitely think that that's going to they're going to be more important as far as like priority because there's not much going on in their fields. Okay. Um, and then about the unemployment, I guess we have another related question. Go ahead. They I know. They try, to, they try to um, apply to the state websites, apply, so it keeps crashing because tr people are trying to file at the same yeah. time. Um, so if they can't file until a week or two later, would they still be able to get back pay for unemployment at the beginning of March when they stopped having gigs? Yes, they should be able to get some of that back based on the date. And I think they're going to go backwards for a lot of people because of the crashing and because of that, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think, I think the unemployment is starting to go backwards for some people that are not able to get in. Um, but I just think they need to keep trying because you have to put the last date of work anyway. So if it started then, that's what you're putting. Um, it's just that you're, you have to wait for it now unfortunately. That gotcha. And then from the same person, um, they said uh, they're live streaming DJ sets and some people are tipping them on Venmo, like $20, for example. Do they have to report all of this tip income for fiscal year 20? Or do they count as like a gift, like, you know, someone like buying them dinner or something like that? No, you definitely need to count that as income. <laughs> now, um, it, it's really weird because Venmo doesn't have like a 1099K yet, like where you get like a 1099 from... But like PayPal didn't used to, if you remember, PayPal didn't used to get a 10, give 1099s. Now they report yep. it to the IRS. I think Venmo Correctly, was going to yeah. eventually do the same way. And you're going to have to report a lot of those things. Um, well, Venmo has a business account and a personal account. So their business yes, accounts, I think, reports a 1099K. Um, I think most people that are have in this accounts. industry have personal uh, accounts because they don't want the fees. That's true. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah. Um, OK, cool. So back about, uh, I guess, some business questions. We have a, uh, if you're S Corp and you want to file for unemployment, but you have reduced your pay, but you have kept other employees on, can you still file for Yes. Yes. I know a lot of people that actually are owners, um, but they wanted to keep their employees on and they've kind of filed for a partial unemployment in Texas. And, and that's um, because they don't want to lose their employees. Um, so a lot of people have been doing that. So definitely, definitely do that. Um, I don't know, I, I, I would assume, nobody's asked this question whether like as a business owner, especially an S Corp, if your unemployment rate's gonna go up, it probably will, but probably but not by a lot. And that's such a small number. Don't ever do the chargeback pay, but just get an increased percentage in unemployment. It's not that big of a deal, but it's only temporary anyways. So um, that's the only caveat to, to doing unemployment on your own business, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, and then if you're a business entity like a LLC, S Corp, et cetera, and take distributions in addition to your payroll, can you use the PPP loan to cover that distribution portion um, of that? It, it may not. That, that we don't have income. a full answer to that. I don't think distributions are included in that payroll cost um, because distributions and draws are basically like retained earnings. And that definitely wouldn't be included. So it may not. Now, well, you could probably argue that like you're making up some of your payroll cost for plus, you know, a portion of it based on yourself. Um, 
S-Corps, I'm not sure. S-Corps are really weird. We've had these conversations in the last few days about, um, because I'm an S-Corp also, and I take a small payroll, right? But then you take a draw also for it to cover that cost. So we've been kind of arguing about whether to include some of that draw based on the monthly payroll cost. And I'm not exactly sure what how they're going to organize that, but we're kind of trying to figure out a number what that looks like as far as like a a pay for the draw for the month and consider that payroll number. Um, S corps are still iffy, um, and I have to. I haven't finished looking through all the new regs. There might be something in that info on there, um, but I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. That's still an iffy number. From my understanding, it's just the S corp payroll, and not the distributions. But arguably, that might change. Did, did another question come in? Yeah. Um, you want to check your chat real quick while I'm looking at the next question? Yes. Awesome. Um, um, let's see. So the next related question is, um, we have gig workers who do events and we have salaried high level workers uh, under PPP. Can we just seek salary bailouts for key workers? If so, do a large number of gig workers weigh down our employee retention proportions so they reduce our forgiveness? Um, okay, say that one more time. I'm also reading too many different things. How do I, oh, okay, there we go. Sorry, okay, there we go. Yeah. So. Can you repeat um, that question? Where, where are no the questions? Worries. Oh, that's where the questions are. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're in the chat, yeah. So we have gig workers who do events. Uh, we have salaried high-level high workers. Under PVP, can we just seek salary bailouts for key workers? If so, do the large number of gig workers weigh down our employee, employee retention proportion so they reduce our forgiveness? I, I think you have to include all the payroll. I like, And that's part of the reason why some people are asking for the W3s and W2s, um, because the whole idea is, um, sorry, I'm, I'm looking for that specific question because that's long and I'm not seeing it. It's um, under the Q&A section on, in the Zoom. Yeah, I'm looking. It's a very top one. Oh, it's a very top one. Ah. No, I'm not seeing it. Um, okay. So uh, I'll repeat it one more time. Um, so they have gig workers who do events. They uh -huh. have salary high level workers. Uh, under PPP, can yeah. they seek salary bailouts for the key workers? If so, do the large number of their gig workers weigh down their employee retention proportion so they reduce their forgiveness? I, I see. So, okay, this is this is a weird one because Basically, I'm assuming when they say gig workers, they mean independent contractors. So for the payroll yeah. number, you would include, this is where it's confusing me, um, you would include the independent contractors in your payroll cost number, right? So the problem is, is that like for the number of employees at the end of it by June 30th, you wouldn't include them. You don't include independent contractors as full-time equivalent employees. And that... Okay. That's my understanding from the new regs that came out last night. And actually, we were having this discussion about, well, that's great because then you could just pay the owners more to like cover to cover that 75% of payroll costs, and that would still cover it, right? And I'm like, I guess because you don't have to – like you could fire independent contractors if you wanted to, which kind of sucks for independent contractors and not have them included. But the, the purpose for all of that is because that independent contractor could, could go themselves, those gig workers can go themselves and just do a PPP. So instead of, you can't, that's double dipping in the numbers of the, uh, the a number of full-time equivalent employees. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So okay. uh, to clarify, uh, you're talking about contractors as 1099s, right? Yes. And then the uh, full-times as W2s. Mm -hmm. So for anyone that's running your business, you. I guess you would have to figure out like if you're paying people 1099s or W2s, that would kind of classify them as contractors or not. I know right. some people pay their full-time employees as 1099s in these in this industry, like or people that work, I guess, 40 hours a week, but not necessarily, I guess, full-time. So right. would that affect their the way they're calculating their full-time equivalents? So the, here's the thing is that like self-employed people, if you're self-employed, it might be a completely different conversation if you are not a self-employed person and you have payroll this the calculation will be um the on the monthly payroll cost the loan amount the may the payroll amount would include all the full-time equivalents all the salaries the wages the tips plus <clears throat> plus um independent contractors at the end of it the full-time equivalent 
number of employees that you have to hire back on by June 30th, that is just employees from my understanding and non-independent contractors. So like if you had like 10 gig workers, like over the last, you know, year, because you had all these events, you don't have to hire all 10 back by June 30th, just the full-time equivalent employees. So two different things, payroll cost includes all of these numbers, but the full-time equivalent employees are just the full-time equivalent employees, if that makes sense. From my understanding of it at this moment. And then um, Holly had a question about, um, she just wanted you to talk more about um, explaining the full-time equivalents for PPP so you could talk mm -hmm. more about it. Um, and Holly, if you have any specific questions on it, if you could send that to us in chat so we could have, have her address that as well. I, I have a, an example. We have like, uh, let's say four 10 hour a week uh, employees. They work 10 hours uh, each week and they're considered, those four people are one full-time equivalent person, right? So all four of them may not, you know, come back to work by June 30th, but one full-time equivalent to replace all four would be sufficient for the loan forgiveness. Does that make more sense a little bit? The whole idea is, is that like, if you have part-timers, several part-timers, they have to be, they have to, um, let's say you have three part-timers, as long as it equals however many, if it's one and a half full-time equivalent for three part-timers, then you have to hire one and a half full-time people, whatever that may mean. You could hire those three people back, but they may be doing something else. They may be hired somewhere else. The whole the point is, is that you're hiring the same amount of hours that you had beforehand that by June 30th. Does that make a little bit more sense? Uh, seems good to me. Um, I think we have another question. Yeah. yeah there's um, go ahead. <laughs> there's a question from Lindsay Lindbergh, um, which says, I have a salesperson who has chosen to move on in this shifting moment. Should I just not claim her in my employee account and claim everyone else in the PPP? Or do I need to hire someone to fill her job, even if we don't need new employees at this moment? No on that. They're going to be calculated because they've already been paid, right? As far as payroll costs, because they're going to, it's going to show up on their payroll report. Is that a payroll? Is it a payroll person specifically or a contractor? Uh, she didn't specify. It just said salesperson. Yeah, I mean, they're they're also going to be used for that number if they are an employee. You basically have to rehire them by June 30th, though. So um, now that's what I was saying about where we're all kind of iffy about like what if the economy is still the same and we can't open up? Like if we can't open up, how are we going to hire employees to do nothing? Like that's really what the conversation is. Like I guess we're just going to hire people to do nothing um, because we don't have a choice because we want it to be forgiven. Right. So that's kind of the conversation we're all having um, or trying to find things for them to do. I, you know, at this point, we just we're all kind of iffy about that. But the consensus in my accounting groups and our CPA group is like, I guess we're hiring people back to do nothing in all these industries that don't have anything. So Tag sorry, did you have a question? This person was a contractor. Oh, this person. Oh, then you don't have to hire them back. They're not included in that loan forgiveness number. They're just included in the calculation. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, related question, uh, someone uh, posts, uh, their business is set up as a single ent entity LLC, mm -hmm. taxed as a pass-through entity. I pay some contractors, but I have no employees. Am I a small business or self-employed? Oh, you might be self-employed if it's a sole prop, even if it's an LLC, um, but you could still do it. There, you definitely should still do the PPP, but they may fall under. Um, I would. I'm telling all my LLC people to still try today and this week to see if they still qualify for the PPP because they still could do their payroll cost based on their independent contractors plus their like um, their you know with their net earnings. But they may be fall under the self-employed uh, contractor number. And so they may have to wait till April 10 to fill out that a different app because there's some different calculations based on that net earnings from self-employment that haven't completely come out yet. So they may qualify for that, but definitely have her start talking to a banker right now just to get, you know, 
like I really want to do this. And I, I, I say they're like Bank of America and then they already have it up or RBFCU, just start applying. It, it's honestly the very, the first step is very basic. So at least they've got it in there. So related to that, um, someone asked if they don't have a business account, um, for your business, how can they apply for a business loan? Well, that's, this is where we come up with a self-employed. So those self-employed people that have a, just a, a personal account, that's why they can't apply for April, till April 10th. So if it's just a self-employed, they're going to have to wait till April 10th. And through their banks, they should be able to apply as a self-employed individual with their personal accounts. So, okay, so without a business account. Yes, okay. without a business account, awesome. right. And I think that's why they made that those dates different because a lot of the self-employed people don't have business accounts. So they have to do a whole different app for those personal accounts specifically. Um, okay, so David asks, what about people who own their own business but also work part-time for another business? They were laid off from the part-time thing that they had. Can they still file for unemployment? Uh, yes, because then it would, it would still be a partial unemployment. Now okay. they'd have to like be you know, forthcoming and say this is where they work you know, and this is how much money they've lost for their other uh, part-time gig, but they, but it would still be a partial unemployment. They should be able to apply for it. Got one from Debbie Stanley on the TWC website. Should we be clicking on apply for benefits or request a disaster unemployment assistance? Payment? Ooh, that is a good question. I don't know that answer. Um, is that bad that I would say do both? <laughs> I mean, I, if nobody's asked me this question, I don't, I mean, I haven't done the new version of it. That must be new. Um, maybe with the new Trump law, I would do the, the, that first and then do the unemployment. Um, because I bet you that new, that new link that you just said might be the extra $600 a week. I bet. I, oh, the extra, the extra checkbox. Yeah. I bet, I that bet be you, I don't know that for a fact because I haven't seen that, but it sounds like it might be like okay, you have to so apply for it separately. So maybe after this call, uh, we'll figure it out. And then yeah. in the notes that we send out to everyone um, from this call, we'll let people know what the distinctions are. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I haven't seen awesome. that. So that might be new. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so we have another question is if you received a retainer for an event six months from now, is that seen as income now? And hence you're not eligible for unemployment? Not necessarily, but I, like, like I said before, if you have money coming in, you just let them know this is, this is what you're getting paid for. You could say like your last, your, you know, your amount that coming forth. And I think even when you're um, responding to it, um, you could say you received a deposit for this month for a future gig. You may have to pay it back. It's not really income. I assume though, it sounds like a deposit if it's an event that hasn't happened yet. Right. So I don't yeah, even know if like I'd call that revenue. Too. Yeah, I wouldn't even call that revenue though. I wouldn't would call that to, deposit. Just a deposit though? I mean, it sounds like it would be. It sounds like a like retainer. Income? Yeah, so, so I don't know if I would income? even, I don't even know if I would even say that, honestly, because to me, that's not revenue. That's somebody else's money, you know? Um, especially if you have to pay it back if it doesn't happen. So I, it, depends on, it depends on the contract, I guess, I should say. So if, it, if you have to pay it back, if it doesn't happen, then I definitely wouldn't even put it on the unemployment application because it's not so, really your money. So we're not sure who asked that question. So if you have more details on that scenario, mm -hmm. please like add it in chat or send another question to clarify um, so we could give you a better answer. Is there anyone else with questions? I think we've knocked out most. Oh, actually, we saw a couple of these on this uh, original list. We have a, um, are contract vendors considered labor or cost of goods sold? Contract vendors are considered labor. Um, you know, for that, for EIDL, when it says cost of goods sold, if you're not, if you don't um, have like something you're selling, like a physical product, I would put zero for cost of goods sold. I mean, or, or use your, like your labor that you, you know, for your events as cost of goods sold. But I really would keep that small of your service industry because cost of goods sold is really inventory that you're selling you know, a percentage markup. So either your your actual labor that you use for your events, I would use for cost goods sold. Um, for the purposes of the PPP, the contract vendors, uh, the contractors are actually considered payroll costs in that number, but they're not considered employees for the full-time equivalents. I know it's confusing. And I can pass off the new regs that came out last night. If anyone's interested, I can send it to you all. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, because uh, that's that was a fun read. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, and is there anyone else in this uh, webinar that has 
any more questions? I know we have about 39 people still on the chat. Just want to see if we covered everything um, while we still have just a bit, bit of time. Um, were, and was there anything that you found that was new that happened this morning, Mari, while we're waiting for questions to come in? Um, really just about the banks not being ready. I was, I'm very surprised that Chase, Chase kept telling me Friday and they're not ready. Um, the, the biggest other thing was what I've been talking about as far as like the independent contractors can be included in the monthly payroll costs, but not for the full-time equivalent employees. That is fairly new um, information. And that arguably there's been some conversation about uh, like some people are saying, it's not independent contractors are not included in the monthly payroll costs because they're not included in that. Um, from what I'm reading, it is included. So I'm sure we're going to get more guidance as we come along. So again, it's super fluid. Everything I'm saying right now is all uh, what we're what we're reading and what we're digesting and what we're understanding. It could change tomorrow or today. There could be new regs saying, no, that's not it. This is how we want you to do it. So just keep informed and keep asking questions because. Um, it's going to be a very changing field, especially since the apps aren't even 100% live yet and they haven't completely processed it. It could completely change by the time it's all over. Um, someone said they're holding their breath as a self-employed yeah. person. Yeah, because there's going to be more guidance on how to calculate that monthly payroll cost and what that means for the loan forgiveness for a self-employment person. I really believe that's completely going to change for self-employed people. I think it's going to be a completely different ball game. Um, for self -employed. So we'll see like on the 10th what things shake out. Well, and we might we may know before then. So just keep kind of watching um, okay. and seeing. And then on the scenario before about the retainer question, they clarified the retainer's non-refundable deposit for a future event. Yes. So how would they, how would non -refundable. they? Non-refundable. Um, so yeah, then they would include it as revenue. Yes. Got it. Yeah, okay. but, but you can say that. Like you can say to unemployment, I I am having this. I have this last income, um, but uh, you know, no future other income, and it's way less than before. So you could still you could still apply for unemployment. Gotcha. And then um, someone had a question about the cost of goods. So they wanted to ask if you could repeat what you said about cost of goods sold for service industry people. Did you say to keep it low unless we're selling products? Is yes. cost of goods not equipment expenses? Right? Question mark. Right. Okay. So cost of goods sold is not operating expenses. You guys cost of goods sold is literally your cost for the revenue you're making. Right. So in, if you're selling a product like our bookstore sells books, the book cost is the cost of goods sold. Right. But you all are selling a service. Right. So, so what do we have for that? We have labor. So I would just use maybe the small amount for um, labor costs, if you like had an event, and, uh, and and I say this for EIDL, because it has gross revenues and cost of goods sold. Those are the two questions they ask that are finance related. Gross revenues, obviously that's, you could just go look at your P&L, get the gross revenues. But the cost of goods sold, I would only use that's what's relative to that revenue, not your rent, not your operating expenses, and maybe not even your admin labor, really just like the labor that you use to make that revenue whatever that may be. So yeah. honestly, you could even put zero because there's no real good cost of goods sold for service industries, except for maybe labor. That, and that's why I was saying to keep it kind of low. Does that make sense? So the, uh, the person I was asking the question was a DJ. Oh. So, I guess, um, so I, guess they're, I guess they're probably asking about their equipment that they have perhaps. Uh, like, like well, the, DJ's buying the equipment, that would be operating costs, right? Or would That it be would be operating costs. costs. He maybe can make an argument that like his records might be, but to me that's more, could be also more of an asset because it's long-term. So I, you know, I'd still keep that pretty low um, for a DJ. I, and also you could also go look at your tax return and like on the tax return, most of my service industries don't have a number in cost of goods sold. They have zero. We have them all in the operating expenses. If you have zero on your cost of goods sold on your tax return, don't just put zero. Okay, cool. Um, yep, yeah, so DJs will probably be zero then. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, I guess related to that cost of goods are Oh, sold. is contract labor considered cost of goods sold? Is that the question? Yes. So yes, it could be contract labor. So like, for instance, me, I do accounting services. I have an accountant that works with me. I would put her as my cost of goods sold. Now my admin person that works for me, I would not put her as cost of goods sold. Does that make sense? So, so for service industries, 
I, it would be the direct labor, not the indirect labor. So like, let's say you have an event specifically and the people that work for you at that event, that could be cost of goods sold for sure. Okay, that answers another question we have, which is uh, I'm an event planner. We pay out our vendors for some of our clients, venues, photographers, et cetera, would that yes. be considered cost of goods sold? Yes, that would be considered cost of goods sold for those events, exactly, because that's directly related to your revenue. Perfect. And then um, we have a question from Ken. Um, he asked, what if I already did the uh, EIDL, IEDL, um, EIDL, I think that's typo, yeah, cost of goods incorrectly on the application? Eh, honestly, everyone's like overthinking me it and like they're tagging me in like their Google Doc. And I'm like, you guys are overthinking this shit. Like just put in some numbers. It could be estimates. It doesn't have to be perfect. If they want to give you, they really just want to know what you're making, like what your gross revenue is. So if you're saying I made $3 million, they're like, oh shit, we need to give this person a $250,000 loan or a $500,000. It's up to 2 million. So I think they just want to get a, a good definition of what you're making. Doesn't have to be perfect. They're going to, if they're going to offer you a loan, they're going to ask for tax returns. They're going to ask for P&Ls, they're going to ask for more things. So it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm not saying lie. Do not lie. Just give a good, reasonable answer for those questions. And if you did the cost of goods sold wrong, it's okay. Not the end of the world. It doesn't mean that you're completely off the table. They just want to know kind of where you're at in respect to small businesses. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, so Katie asks, is uh, the CARES Act the same as the SBA loan? Uh, I'm sure we covered this earlier, but if you want to expand on that. So the CARES Act includes the EIDL information, the, um, the PPP, all of the above. The CARES Act kind of explains all of it. And actually, it's a link for the CARES Act. It's really long. We've been looking at it, like digesting it all weekend long. Like the, you know, the greatest function is the control F because we're like, what about contractors? Control F. Everywhere it says contractors. We're like searching the whole bill. But that does include the SBA loan. Um, don't forget, like the, on, on the CARES Act, that's the bill that talks about the EIDL, which is the SBA loan. And the PPP, it's, it's under underwritten by the SBA. It's just that it goes through the private bank. So it's, they're both SBA loans, but just the way it's organized is different, if that makes sense. Because the, the PPP is, it's, it's like the 7A SBA loans that are already kind of out there. And they're, so they're underwritten by SBA, but that goes to the private banks. And then the EIDL is also an SBA loan, and that goes directly through the SBA.gov website, if that makes sense. So they're both SBA. So the CARES Act is really just the bill that covers all that detail. That makes sense. And like I said, if you go to the Congress website and look for the CARES Act, you can find the whole entire bill itself, as, as, as well as the new regs that came out last night. So if you're really super interested. <laughs> we can actually share that, those okay. website links when we um, email out the video of this webinar to everyone Great. who's registered. Awesome. And is there any more questions that we have um, from Adi before we close it up for today? Um, anyone from the from the group? I know we've gone through quite a lot. Um, if if not, um, can you, Madi? Can you tell us where uh, our listeners can find you at? Like, what's uh, what are good places to find more information about you, or anything else you want to promote during this time while we're? Um, oh gosh! I, see, I've said that during this time I would update my website, but I have not. I've been a terrible and, uh, job I updating. About that. Like I know <laughs> I'm the worst. I need to do it. Um, but I'm just always the busy and that is not my forte, you guys. So someone wants to, uh, anyways, uh, but my email is Madi. It's super easy. Madi at MadiCPA.com. Um, I'm on, um, Instagram, probably my hard Instagram. I, I, I can, I can share that. It's like Madi Alicia. It's M A R I. A L C I A is my Instagram. Uh, people hit me up on that a lot. Surprisingly, I don't know why, but they do hit me up on Instagram a whole lot. Um, and then my website's modicpa.com. Although Jonathan, you'll have to help me later because people have been saying that they've been doing the contact me link and like filling out the thing and I'm not getting an email, but anyways, okay, you we'll can just, just email that. We'll me. Fix that today. I'll fix that today then. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you can so. just email me at Madi at modicpa.com too. Yeah, totally so her awesome. email is mari at maricpa.com. Yes. And um, I think we have one, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have all our information, the recap email as well, um, that we'll be sending to everyone that attended. Oh, someone well asked slides. how many, one EIDL slide. asking how many employees I have, which is zero, just me. I would just put zero, if it's just you. Cool. 
Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Is uh, Sarah, do we have anything else? Nope, just wanted to let everyone know that we'll get an email out to everyone um, once the video is done processing through Zoom. So we'll recap this. We'll send you those updated regulations as well as Mari's contact information. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much everyone for attending and thank you Mari for uh, taking your lunch time here to talk to us about um, what we're supposed to do. No problem, what's lunch? I don't even know what that is yet anymore. I don't need <laughs> it anymore. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.